Back, we're live. We're here on Think Tech, having a wonderful Monday, right, John? Yep. Yeah. <laughs> She's so nice. That's <laughs> Jenna Long. She is the supply chain manager of Pacific Biodiesel. There's only one like her. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> oh, two. Okay. And she is the daughter of Bob and Kelly King, and uh, I have known her for a while. I can. I'm trying to place that. So I was back when, uh, uh, um, yeah. The uh, Hawaii Science and Technology Council, I think I met you there at oh, a meeting. Yeah. Uh, Lisa Gibson was organizing a meeting at the Pacific Club, and there you were, and I met yeah. you. And you're not much older now. <laughs> I wish. <laughs> anyway, today is uh, Hawaii, the state of clean energy, here on a Monday at 3 o'clock. And we're talking about fossil-free transportation. How are we doing? Okay, and the key to that is, you know, like uh, Pacific Biodiesel does biofuel, and so the inherent question in the way I pose it is, how does biofuel relate to fossil-free transportation? Okay, so this, we're going to study that today with you. All right. Because you know about <laughs> that. After all, you're the supply chain manager. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so what is it like being a supply chain manager? Uh, it's actually very hectic and interesting. <laughs> so I uh, help bring in all of our raw feedstock to the plant and move all our finished product out. And we... Um, are making over 200,000 200, gallons of biodiesel a month right now, so there's a lot to move. <laughs> Put that in perspective for me. How many gallons of, say, gasoline is the state using? Any idea? I'm not sure on the gasoline, but um, for diesel fuel, the Big Island itself uses about um, 11 million gallons of diesel fuel a, a year mm -hmm. um, for just on-road transportation. So that doesn't include any of the power plants or off-road use. Okay, and you're making? We're making about 200,000 gallons So that's a substantial so dent in it, it at is. least on the Big Island. Yeah. At our full capacity, we could provide enough for about 50% of the on-road diesel um, that's used in the on the Big Island. Right okay, now. so let me start getting this straight. It's, 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 uh, the outlines of our discussions are beginning to reveal themselves. So on the Big Island anyway, um, your, uh, how, how, how much was the total of diesel used? Uh, about 11 million. 11 gallons. million, so okay, 200,000. So that's, what is that, 2%? You get that right? 11, so uh, we uh, can make about 5 million gallons a year. But you could make 5 production. million, and yeah. that's about half, or yeah. a little, little less than half. Right. Okay, and, and, and you make it with agricultural material. Um, actually, primarily we use waste materials. Okay, restaurant, um, restaurant yeah, waste. We're slowly moving towards agricultural materials as we can, uh, but it's still a very limited um, portion of what we're doing right now. Okay. Uh, mostly it's restaurant wastes and uh, recently even uh, rendering plant waste products um, from the West the Coast. The slaughterhouse kind. Yeah, yeah, just to help fill in uh, because there's only so much cooking oil that yeah. we can yeah. uh, produce. So you have to find <laughs> new sources. Yeah. Right. So the first source is restaurant. That's your right. traditional That's historical our favorite source. source. Yeah, favorite and you got the technology to do the good yeah. job on that, easy, efficient, and all that. So that's number one. But then you run out of that, and uh, you go to rendering waste. But that's from the mainland. You have to ship right. it in because we don't really have a rendering. Right. We don't have a rendering. We plan. don't yet. Um, yeah. There are plans in the works. Um, there's actually construction happening on one on the Big Island, right now. Where? Um, in uh, it's going to be in Pauwilo. Uh, oh, good. So north of Hilo. Are there, are there, is that servicing the Parker Ranch? Or? Um, it will service Hawaii p beef producers, which has a slaughterhouse in that area, um, and they're hoping maybe the rest of the island as well. Okay, so you capture, really, you know, you're the only one, and you'll capture it all, right? They'll be um, happy to sell you their we're, rendering. Because yeah, right? otherwise they'd have to throw it away. Yeah. Either that or um, there's some other minor uses for it, but I think uh, we're hoping biodiesel will be the main use for that oil. Okay, so, okay. So those are the, mm, those are the, oh, and then after that, there's plants. After that, there's agriculture. Detrofa, for example. Right. So Detrofa is one, um, and we have some of that planted, and um, that's, um, we're doing some testing on that. Um, that's actually, not moving as fast as you want it to move, though. It's, it's not, yeah. It's, um, it's a tricky plant. Um, one of the biggest challenges to Detrofa is that the byproduct um, meal out of it is toxic, so you can't feed it to animals as oh, you want too bad. to. So you so want to have both have of those another, possibilities. Right, so. you have to have another product to uh, make out of that byproduct. Who are the candidates? I mean, other products? Um, I think right now most of it's going to a compost or maybe even a biochar type material. Um, 
But if you wanted to still... find another plant, what would you use? Oh, um, actually, we're looking at some right now, but um, our we have a crushing mill facility on the Big Island that is um, actually our, their favorite feedstock right now is macadamia nuts. <laughs> so they're they're That's taking macadamia nuts, yeah. um, crushing it, and um, they get the mac nuts from the factories. So they're basically the waste nuts. So this is an agricultural waste product um, being crushed. The oil can be used for biodiesel. Um, we're actually using a little bit for soap as well right now. Um, and then the meal part of it is actually a good cattle feed. So okay, what was AKP supposed to? You know, Ionico Opono. They were supposed to be doing agricultural biofuel. What was their stock? Um, you know, I I haven't found out what their actual plant <laughs> <laughs> that they were going to use. Um, I think it was asked of them at one of the meetings, but um, was not revealed at least um, at oh, any really? meetings okay. that I was at. So we don't so really know. I'm not exactly sure what yeah. plant material they were going to use, yeah. and they had a different process um, that they were planning to yeah. to put it under. Um, so they weren't going to start with an oil crop, which is the thing that we start with. Our crops have to iner inherently have an oil in them, and then we basically are just pressing it out and releasing the oil. We're not creating the, um, the energy in the plant. <clears throat> right. Okay. So are you, is there anybody else doing this in Hawaii? Uh, as far as we know, nobody's commercially making biofuels um, at, at this scale. And your refineries, can I use that word? You know, yeah. Your refineries, you have one on Maui, the original, I guess. That was our oldest one. Your yeah. oldest one. And you have one on the Big Island, that was mm -hmm. that was your big and high-tech one. Right. This is our, our Big Island is the newest um, and the greatest capacity. Um, we have one on Oahu, um, which is currently um, not producing biodiesel, they are still collecting oils, they're consolidating it, they're doing a pre-processing on it, and then sending it to us on the Big Island to make biodiesel. Um, and then our Maui facility was actually dismantled. Um, I remember recently. reading that, yeah. yeah. So you're not using that anymore, it's finished. So, yeah, we're not using the facility, we are still using the site just to collect oils, consolidate them, and again ship them you move to around. the Big Island. Yeah. Yeah. And, and as the uh, supply chain manager, you would know what moves yeah. where. <laughs> I get to move all of that. <laughs> so why did you close the one in Maui? I mean, was it the technology was old or what? The technology was old, um, so we actually stopped making biodiesel there last year. Um, the, the thing about our Big Island plant is it's much more efficient, and so it uses fewer chemicals um, in the process, but also um, the fuel quality is much better. So once we started making the fuel on the Big Island, um, we felt like it was an upgrade in fuel for our customers and, and not a lot of people wanted to go back. <laughs> yeah. So we um, now do all of our production out of the Big Island. Um, so that was one reason that we stopped making biodiesel there, but we did have to take um, all of our storage tanks out, um, partially due, due to permitting issues. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so uh, I guess in, at least for the foreseeable future, you're gonna do your heavy lifting, or at least your, your commercial lifting right. <laughs> uh, in, in the Big Island. Right. Where is it in the Big Island? In, in the Hamakua um, also? It's actually south of Hilo, about eight miles south in KL. Mm -hmm. yeah. Near Shipman. Near Ship it's actually in Shipman Business in Shipman. Park, yeah, oh, in the okay. industrial park there. Oh, great. Yeah. Perfect location yeah, for it, Yeah, it's actually. a good, good yeah. location for a smelly um, <laughs> yeah, <good>. company. <laughs> so, you know, I, now, now in terms of the diesel, I mean, what interests me about uh, what you described is, is that Theoretically, you're not far away from replacing diesel fuel, at least on the Big Island. And if 11 million gallons are used, then you're, you know, creating half as much. That's nearly 50 percent of all the diesel fuel, and it's a perfect substitution. Am I right? You don't have to adapt your vehicle. Correct. You just pour mm -hmm. in the biofuel, and it works just like fossil diesel Correct. works. Correct. Yeah, we have um, all kinds of models of trucks and cars and and boats and um, equipment it has to be diesel but if it runs on diesel fuel uh, most likely it'll run on biodiesel there's very few exceptions yeah um, that so uh, the, that's really that's really important so then you could really I mean you right now you're making a significant niche but you could do a huge niche if you could ramp up uh, you know the production yeah. that's one of the exciting things about biodiesel is um, how easy it is to use, and the fact that you can switch to completely by you know using biodiesel in your car without um, damaging so we, your car right. or anything. And yeah. so um, that was one of the exciting things for us is 
um, the fact that you can blend it if you want, but you don't have to. So we can actually go petroleum free in our vehicles um, right away, right off the factory. Diesel, floor. diesel, yeah, diesel vehicles. You know, <laughs> and, and the question That's, then is how how many? Let's just take the Big Island as a kind of microcosm here. Um, how 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 much of the well? How many? What's the percentage of diesel cars to all the cars? You got an idea? You know, I don't have any info on that. Um, it's obviously smaller. It's <laughs> the smaller, diesel cars are a fraction of the the gasoline yeah. cars on the passenger side. Um, on the heavy duty transportation, it's a bigger um, area, percentage. It's there are mostly diesel. So that's they're, really they're mostly diesel. Mostly diesel. Okay. Yeah. Uh, once you get to the semi truck um, arena, they're all diesel. Okay. So. Um, that's where we've been really focusing, where we can make an impact on transportation is in the heavy duty, um, larger vehicles that need the power of the diesel um, fuel. Okay, well and, this is getting yeah. interesting now. And in that area, there's actually few, um, very few alternatives for them as well. So, um, you know, when you look at batteries and electric vehicles, when you get to the higher heavy duty. Can't get duty, an electric truck um, so easily. Yeah, it's yeah. so a trickier to have a full electric um, yeah. Semi truck. <laughs> now, what about the other islands? I mean, uh, is there a market, say, in Kauai? Uh, and I suppose mm. there, there must be a residual market in Maui anyway. Right. And in Oahu, yes. Yeah, Big Island actually uses the most diesel fuel for trucking because the island's so large and yeah. everything moves back and forth across the island. Yeah. But um, there's plenty of um, trucking going on on all the islands. So there's. So there's all a good of those market. are potential buyers. For yeah. Are they buying now? I mean, you have supply. May I say supply chain connections <laughs> on all the neighbor islands? Um, almost all the islands um, are distributing biodiesel. We don't have very much distribution on Kauai. That's our kind of our last um, area to look at. Um, right now, we're selling to private individuals on Kauai, but there's no uh, real commercial mm. biodiesel. How about Oahu? Oahu, there's plenty of fuel available. We actually distribute it through um, Aloha Petroleum and Midpack Petroleum. So it's cool. um, good for them. Yeah, it's great. They've stepped up and realized that um, this is a fuel just like the diesel fuel that they distribute, and they can easily move that around, as, move our biodiesel as well. So. You know, Jenna, this makes me think that uh, if, I, if I'm really committed, you know, to uh, fossil-free transportation, then one surefire way of doing that is to buy a diesel car. Um, uh, you know, now there was a time back in the 70s and the 80s where there's a lot of diesel cars. You know, everybody <laughs> thought they were really terrific. I don't know if that's still the time. I don't. I don't think I know anybody who actually drives a diesel car. Are there yeah. diesel cars around these days? There are. Um, there are fewer than there were, um, and most of them are not American, <laughs> as <laughs> what they were back in the '60s and '70s. But um, Volkswagen's got some, BMW, Mercedes. Um, there's a lot of Euro the European brands are bringing um, diesel cars to America, and there's new ones coming out as well. Um, uh, GM just came out with a diesel version of the Chevrolet Cruze, so <clears throat> there's more passenger cars being available now. Um, it's still a small fraction of the models that are available in gasoline. Yeah, sure. Um, but when you go to other places in the world, you see there's uh, Nissan Civics and other cars are, are made in diesel yeah. in Asia. In Europe, places. in Asia, in yeah, Europe, a lot of diesel yeah. cars. Yeah. They just don't bring them to America. Yeah, um, now are they making them, you say there's, you know, there's a sort of a new, God, forgive me for this, a new energy in <laughs> 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 making, and maybe Detroit making some diesel cars, but are they doing this, you know, uh, for the, pros the possibility of biodiesel, or are they just doing it for old times, <laughs> old times' sake? Um, not so much for biodiesel. Um, actually, most of them don't focus on the fact that you can put biodiesel in there. Although Chevrolet Cruze did come out and say you can put a 20% biodiesel blend in this in this new Cruze, um, but most of them are actually focusing on the fuel efficiency side of it. So they're saying buy a diesel car because you'll get 30% better miles per gallon, and that way you'll cut your fossil, you know, your carbon footprint. Um, mm -hmm. So. It does have that so it's benefit efficiency as well. efficiency more than, more than <laughs> right. the origin of the fuel. And, and with the higher gas prices and fuel prices in general, they're seeing that maybe there's more demand for more fuel efficient cars. Yeah. Um, but yeah, they haven't really um, jumped on board with, with um, promoting the biodiesel use in their cars yet. But um, theoretically, um, you could, if you take a, a, a diesel car, a, you're getting the efficiency of a diesel car, which is going to be that, that way even if you use 
you know, conventional diesel in right. it. And B, you're getting the biodiesel benefit right. where you can say, you know, you're not using any fossil fuel. Right, right. Um, and then the third point is the diesel cars actually last longer. So <laughs> your car will actually, um, will, will be a Because the way the investment. engine is constructed right. and They're all pretty that. Um, durable engines. Are they more expensive? Um, they are more expensive yeah. because of those three, <laughs> because of two or <laughs> two of those three factors. Um, Speaking of expense, what about the expense of biofuel? What about the expense of your biofuel? Are you competitive with conventional biofuel? Um, we're, we're, yeah, we're cost competitive with conventional diesel. Um, we're kind of the only biofuel that's made for a diesel vehicle, so there's not very many other. Uh, okay, so does that mean it's the same price as conventional diesel? Just about. Um, really? In, in some places, we're actually cheaper. Um, and it just depends on the price of diesel that week or that, that month. Okay. But most most of the time, um, we're very competitive or cheaper. Okay. Well, that really sort of lays out the territory. We're going to take a short break. We're going to come. We're going to come back. We're going to drill down exactly, you know, the title question, I suppose, and that is, uh, mm, 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 fossil free transportation in Hawaii. How do we get there? I know that's a big challenge, big, but we. we <laughs> Big we'll wrap our arms around that. Okay, and that's uh, the, uh, that's Jenna Long. She is the supply chain manager for Pacific Biodiesel out of Maui or Oahu. I am currently based in Hilo. Yes. Okay, All right. <laughs> you, you said that. The other one. <laughs> okay, and uh, this is Hawaii, the state of clean energy, and uh, here on Think Tech Talks, I'm Jay Fidel. We'll be back in, in a short while. We'll be right back. I'm Jay Fidel. Come and watch AgriTech in Hawaii on Mondays from 4 to 5 p.m. Uh, we'll introduce you to farmers, uh, agricultural officials, agricultural experts, and academicians. You'll learn about agriculture, which is very important in Hawaii. Come and watch us. Aloha, my name is Willow Chang Elion, and I host a show called The Art of Life. We air live every Friday from 2 to 3 p.m. And what we do is basically we focus on individuals who create a unique sense of place for Hawaii. These are movers and shakers, artists, innovators. They are also traditionalists. They're all involved in the archival process and they make this place a unique place, one that makes Hawaii a richer place to be. I hope you do join us and certainly tell your friends about the show, whether they live here or they live abroad. It's a way to give back to our community. We're keeping it pumping. Hey, we're back, we're live. We're at Think Tech Talks here on a given Monday, three to four talking about Hawaii, the state of clean energy, with Jenna Long, who is the supply chain manager of Pacific Biodiesel out of, well, headquarters in Maui, but she works out of Hilo, and she spends a lot of time here in Oahu, too. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're talking about uh, fossil fuel, fossil-free transportation in Hawaii. I mean, to go to that for a minute, it's the bugaboo, mm -hmm. because we really haven't, in a larger sense, achieved much progress there. I mean, in fact, uh, you know, it's between you and electric cars. Mm -hmm. There are 1,800 electric cars in the state. It's not very much, yeah. not going nearly as fast as you might have hoped. Um, and you have a lot more diesel vehicles, at least that are potentially customers for biofuel. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have these, these two elements. Uh, there's a third element is, um, is hydrogen cars, which is kind of like an electric car, mm -hmm. uses a battery. Uh, and in that case, um, most of them are government and buses, right. you know, and there's not a lot of, and I don't think there's any. If I wanted to go out and buy a hydrogen car today, good luck. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be searching. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it isn't around. So, you know, so it seems to me that uh, you are one of the promising possibilities in moving us there. I mean, we're never going to be able to do um, aviation fuel, because that's just too complex for us, for the state of Hawaii. And we talked about uh, algae for a while about that. And we had a facility going on in Kauai, but the next time you look, no facility, no <laughs> algae, <laughs> and no aviation, uh, no biofuel aviation. Um, so the question is uh, uh, really cars and trucks on the highways, that's transportation. And uh, people talk about uh, getting very efficient and having carpooling and car sharing. They talk about, uh, have you heard of uh, Uber? Which is where you, have your, you can dial 
uh, our cab, oh, okay. which could be a cab or maybe not a cab, mm -hmm. <laughs> who will come to you in a matter of seconds or minutes and take you where you want to go, and that puts fewer cars on the highway, on the street, so that's one way of doing it. But I think ultimately the way people see it, it's, it's the way the car, the vehicle, the truck works, and it's either it's gas or it's electric or it's biofuel or blast hydrogen. So how is this going to proceed? Am I, I, are you growing in your supply chain by leaps and bounds? Do you see some dramatic thing happening which, which tells you the direction of all of this? Um, we're growing slowly. Um, it's been a long, slow growth for us um, as a company. Um, even since building this new facility, uh, which the new facility itself with the capacity we have is a pretty big leap for us. We went from about a million and a half gallon capacity for the whole state between Oahu and Maui to um, this five million gallon a year capacity. Um, so we increased our capacity quite a bit. It's still a very small portion of the state's um, fuel use. Um, but um, our growth to get to that capacity has been a slow, challenging one. <laughs> yeah. uh, it's not, not been easy by any means. But um, theoretically, if you could get by, we'll talk about the challenges, but if you could get by whatever those challenges are, and if people, you know, would, would take the plunge, I mean, people with, with diesel mm -hmm. uh, vehicles would take the plunge, then we could have, uh, you know, a, a substantial number of vehicles running on biofuel. Good. Um, and so um, that would that would be one element. I mean, everybody always says, "Oh, you, you know, you can't have only one solution. You have to have many solutions. You have to see how it all works out, and so forth." And you know, I think we all have to agree with that because it's too early in the game for us to know what is the magic solution or whether there should be one only right. one solution. And Co the nice thing about biodiesel is it's um, it's got its its niche its niche areas, um, heavy duty trucking or even generators or boats um, can use it. Um, but it's, it can be blended in with other, um, other renewable energies, such as solar and wind. Um, we're not expecting to replace all of the electrical no, no, power or any of those other, other things. The thing about biofuel, though, is it runs 24 by 7. It does. <laughs> it's completely firm and dispatchable. Right. And it's a nice backup to other technologies. So it's a nice backup to the solar or the wind. Um, so HECO can use it in their generators to back up the other technologies rather than use it as a prime well, power. I hate um, to tell you this, they, but they, they are using it, but it comes from somewhere else, <laughs> <laughs> right? Aren't they using a couple a, uh, what do you call it, f fast response, uh, peak, peaking, peaking plant down in Kapolei? They, they got, they got a huge biofuel. tank of biofuel out there, which they mm -hmm. get on a boat from somewhere else. They do. Um, actually, recently we've sent some of ours that direction as well. They are using some of our fuel in that power oh, good. plant. Oh, um, good. And you know they're going back out for periodically for new um, bids for that fuel. So um, they have to compete. So we have to compete with others, which is fair. And um, well, I don't know if it's we'll fair. I mean, if you're <laughs> but if you're doing it locally, you don't think you should have an advantage. Um, yeah, we would we would hope that they would. I mean, if building a local industry, right. that means something. Yeah. And actually, Helco has been very supportive. Hiko, Helco, and the whole group have been um, pretty supportive of our locally produced power. Um, they've um, really stepped up and, and, um, and favored that kind of thing. Um, <clears throat> we do have a, a contract to supply fuel to the um, emergency power plant here on Oahu, and um, one of I think the neatest things is they use our fuel in um, most of their fleets. Mm -hmm. So they actually use it as a transportation fuel as mm -hmm. well um, on the Big Island, Oahu, um, and elsewhere. So it's hard for you to go into high quantity production if you don't know that you're going to win the bid for a particular installation like the peaking plant. If you, if you go, if you spend the money for all kinds of refinery equipment or whatever you need in order to deliver big volume to them, you, you can't be sure that you'll get the work, mm -hmm. get the transact. And if you can't be sure, that that would be a, that'd be bad because <laughs> then you will have spent money and you have no way of recapturing right. and so forth. And that's why we like 
like this type of fuel because there are so many markets for it. Uh, we know that it can be used in trucks and boats and, and other things, so we don't have to rely on one market, such as the utility, um, to use all of our fuel. Um, yeah. For example, um, the bus system here on Oahu could actually use all of our production yes. if they switched over to biodiesel. Yes, so and that would be so easy. Yeah, and it would be be pretty easy for them. Yeah. Um, so there's there's definitely other large uh, volume markets out there, and um, some of them which might be a better use for our biodiesel in the long term, um, such as road transport. Well, what's holding up the bus deal? Why? You know, I mean, <laughs> for my money, you should have the buses. Period. Uh, yeah, we're hoping hoping that will um, transpire. <laughs> okay. They're, um, I'm they locking actually, wood. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> they actually did a demonstration project recently um, and ran ran their buses on the bi biodiesel blend, um, and it was successful. So we're hoping that soon they can uh, get it into their their main fuel stream. Okay. Well, then then the other thing that comes to mind only because you've mentioned it a couple of times is boats, but I mean uh, boats include ships, doesn't it? I mean, we, we are an isolated, you know, archipelago, as they say, and uh, we have to bring in so many things by boats, some of which we shouldn't bring in, but <laughs> there you have it. And so these boats and ships all use diesel fuel. That was an attempt, I mean, I don't think it was a seri all that serious an attempt by, was it, Young Brothers, um, to convert or use, at least for a test, uh, biofuel maybe 10 years ago. I don't think that went anywhere. But theoretically, the biofuel that you guys make is worthy of marine engines, right? It's the same thing as the trucks, right? Right, right. It can be used in um, um, marine engines that run on, currently run on diesel fuel. Um, some of the boats that are currently um, moving inner island or, or even to the mainland run on actually a um, different grade of diesel fuel, ours is a little bit cleaner than that grade. So, so is that um, it make should, it easier then? Should make it easier to. Um, so they could they could run the rough stuff, but they, they'll do better running your stuff. Yeah, their emissions that? would actually they could actually clean up their emissions a little bit by yeah, using yeah. Uh, this lower sulfur fuel. So why don't they all sign up? <laughs> we, um, that's the question. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, it seems to me as a matter of policy, Hawaii companies should support Hawaii renewable resources, and this is one of them. And yeah. we could be flush with uh, biofuel like the kind you make in, in all our marina operations. So. Yeah, we hope, um, we hope that as people learn about it and understand the fact that it can run in the conventional diesel engine, that they, they do make that switch. Um, sometimes it's just that um, mechanics don't understand what it is or the fact that it can run without modification. Um, a lot of people still think of biodiesel as filtered vegetable oil, um, so they think that you need to do modifications to your vehicle to run it. Um, yeah. And so we actually do get quite a few people um, coming on board as soon as they learn that it's easy to use and it's price competitive. Um, we, we have a lot of people that make that quick decision to and switch And it doesn't over. give your engine cavities. <laughs> it doesn't. <laughs> We'll take a short break here and come back and talk about the challenges. That's Jenna Long. She is the supply chain manager of Pacific Biodiesel. So like a great job, actually. Mm -hmm. And we're talking today about um, fossil-free transportation in Hawaii and how we can get there here on Think Tech Talks, specifically uh, on our show called Hawaii, the, clean, uh, the State of Clean Energy. I'm Jay Fidel. I'll be right back, and then we get down to the challenges and we'll meet them all right <laughs> we'll try i'm hong jiang host for asia in review on tuesdays and i'm david day host for asian review on thursdays both of us broadcast our respective shows at 4 p.m and my topics tend to deal with uh, questions related to environment culture history and sometimes human rights and my shows tend to be on international business, foreign policy, geopolitics, and national security. And you can watch our shows live on the ThinkTech website at thinktechhawaii.com. And uh, you can also watch us on YouTube or Olalo. So come join us on Thursdays at 4 p.m. I'm David Day. And Bye. on Tuesdays at 4 p.m., I'm Hong Jiang. Aloha. Aloha. 
Okay, we're back. We're live. We're here with Jenna Long, Pacific Biodiesel Supply Chain Manager, talking about um, fossil-free transportation in Hawaii, really important. And it, and it certainly appears from our discussion so far that biofuel could be a significant element, maybe a transformative element, element in our transportation, our ground transportation, our and our, you know, our, also our ships, actually. So <clears throat> why isn't it? I'm asking you about the challenges you, you referred to earlier. Uh, well, some of the challenges are um, just the, the technology. Um, it's the diesel engine technology has changed a little bit. Um, biodiesel actually has changed along with it, and it's become a lot um, better over the years. Um, but there was a time back when biodiesel first started where it was a very crude process. Um, many people were doing it on their own, and um, there's actually a lot of memory of that time from mechanics and others who um, tried it back then and it didn't work so well. So um, the new fuel is actually much better. It meets a lot of new specifications that didn't even exist back then. Um, so it's it's a partly a perception issue. Um, <clears throat> people perceive that it won't work because it's it was strained vegetable oil back, you know, people were doing it that way. Um, now the fuel is actually um, processed much differently. We um, distill it at our Big Island plant, and so that takes out a lot of um, impurities, things, impurities yeah. and even the color that was in there before. Mm -hmm. um, so I think um, just we have to do a re-education, and that's what our company's been doing the last couple of years, is a re-education on this is what biodiesel is today. It's um, very compatible with diesel vehicles, and um, and in fact, it's cost competitive as well. Mm -hmm. um, so part, partly that, that's that been a challenge, just getting through that perception. Yeah, okay, it's, you know, it reminds me of tilapia, you know, because uh, people remember tilapia as being a canal fish and now Alan Wong makes, you know, four <laughs> different kinds of tilapia. It's all delicious. Right. And it's all clean and neat and beautiful. Right. And uh, people still think it's a canal fish. <laughs> 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 Even though it's a, it's a delicacy around the right. world. You know, local people, a lot of local people will not touch tilapia. <laughs> they got to get over that. It's the same thing. It's a question of same perception. Yeah. And it's the same... Uh, same way to tackle is just to try it. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. So once you once you try it, you know that it works and um, that it's it's fine as a fuel. So what about the, you talked about specifications? So somebody is somebody is setting standards here. Uh, who who is setting standards and what are the standards and how do you how are you able to meet the standards? There's actually an ASTM standard, which is the ASTM is the group that creates standards for all kinds of materials. Um, they have a standard for biodiesel fuel for the U.S., um, and that is reviewed regularly and, and updated regularly. Um, this is a series of, you know, a dozen or two dozen specifications, things like how much water can be in it, how much sediment, how much um, glycerin, which is the soapy material that we pull out. Um, basically, it just um, points to make sure that the fuel is, is of a high quality. Um, so all of our fuel meets that standard. Um, and it has uh, since we started so. producing fuel. Um, the standard itself has changed, which has made the fuel better um, over the last decade. So, uh, I mean, I can have a fair degree of confidence that if I buy biofuel today in the state of Hawaii, which is mostly from you, I think, um, <clears throat> it will, is not going to gunk up my car. It's gonna, not going to have any negative effect on my, my car, my engine, and so forth. And it's going to act at least as good as, as conventional diesel. Yeah, I can't speak for other people's biofuel. Just yours. <laughs> but for our, our fuel, yeah, it all meets the national standard, and it and um, that means that it's going to be compatible with the diesel vehicle <clears throat> yeah. in in most of the forms that it is today, as compatible as a diesel fuel would be, because diesel fuel has its own um, ASTM specification. Okay, so now. Oh, diesel, conventional diesel has its own specification, right. Right. but that specification will be very similar to the biodiesel similar, specification. Similar, um, slightly different, yeah, <clears throat> because of the slightly different characteristics of biodiesel. Right, but I mean, uh, when you talk about um, uh, contaminants and, um, right. you know, things that would do, would, would do something to your engine, 
right. it's the same, isn't it? Right. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so <clears throat> that's um, now. I guess the first question is how you make people understand that. You could, of course, come on Think Tech Hawaii talk mm -hmm. about it. <laughs> we could, <laughs> <laughs> and we do. <laughs> Um, but you know, how do you? How, this is an old story, and it exists in many contexts in, in the state. Uh, how do you convince people who are steadfast in you know not knowing the deal <laughs> and resisting? How do you how do you change the way they think? Uh, well, we try to um, look at it from several different ways. You know, there's we we talk a lot about the environmental benefits of biodiesel, and so that actually. Um, turns some people who might not otherwise look at it when you when you talk to them about the fact that okay if you spill this on the ground it's going to biodegrade if you spill it in the ocean it's going to biodegrade um, it's got other reasons to try it rather than just the fact that it runs the same as diesel um, mm -hmm. we also talk a lot about the fact that it's locally made and when you buy the biodiesel you're supporting your neighbor and your community um, you're supporting jobs across the state from the people who collect the oil to the people who make it, make the biodiesel, and the people who distribute it. And, some, and, and at some point in the future, a lot of agricultural labor right. will be involved in this. Right. Stuff. And if we can get to that agricultural stage, um, that's actually um, multiples of jobs that would be uh, be going on in the agricultural yeah, field. Yeah, um, yeah. For every every gallon of um, fuel that we'd make, that's a lot of acres. Um, you know. You'd have to harvest the well, acres and a lot of jobs that would be. Great. I wanted to ask you about that because I'm, you know, I follow. We follow diversified agriculture a lot. Big Island is a kind of a perfect place for it. I mean, it has all this fallow land from the days of the plantations. But um, you know, um, query whether it has to be whether biofuel has to grow in a kind of plantation and uh, you know big refinery kind of model or whether it can grow kind of like wine, like grapes mm -hmm. for wine, where you have a lot of farmers out there with relatively small plots, and they and you tell them how, you show them how, they grow it, and they deliver like the grapes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> they deliver the biofuel to you, or the, the stock to you, and, and then you refine it and you know sort of works on a co-op basis, and that's not the right word, but right. On, a, on a centralized basis with a lot of diversified farmers involved having their own businesses and making their hopefully middle-class lives doing that. Mm -hmm. um, so query, is that model in play? I mean, could that happen? Or are we talking about larger installations uh, that would be controlled by fewer people? Um, we've always hoped for the distributed model. Um, it's, um, with the biofuel crops, especially the type of crops that we would grow for oil, um, we don't envision that you would be able to have a large plantation and make money just on the biofuel part, and just for growing oil for crops. Um, you're going to need to diversify just to make the farm work. Um, the fact is that until the price of oil, <laughs> the price of the barrel goes way up and you can make a lot of money by growing oils, you're not going to support your whole farm just by growing oil. Um, even if you have a few crops or a few um, uh, byproducts from that crop, um, it probably is going to work better if your farm can grow several different kinds of crops, rotate the biofuel crops in maybe in the interim between your food crops and your other. Is that other is that a problem of any kind? Uh, you know, to rotate uh, sage athropa. I don't know if that's the right one, but say a biofuel crop with other, you know, strictly food crops. Uh, is there a, is there a negative aspect to that rotation? Um, I'm, I'm not a farmer, so <laughs> I don't want to say for sure, but I don't believe in most cases, I don't think there is. Um, actually, I've heard farmers talk about the fact that um, having a diff completely different kind of crop can actually help break up the bug cycle, for example. So yeah, sure. you've got a, a, a cycle of bugs that Sometimes comes it's through. healthy, yeah. There's a whole different type of crop that the bugs can't live on um, for one season, and then um, that might help your next crop, actually. Um, so there's Actually, the agricultural side has a lot of really interesting variables to it, um, and we're just starting to learn a lot about that. But there's so much to learn that we're, we're going to be learning about it for a while. Um, well, it's an interesting possibility because, as you say, if you, if, if you do uh, biofuel on a diversified, a distributed basis, 
uh, you improve diversified agriculture because the farmers are not only doing the biofuel, they're doing other food crops. Mm -hmm. And so now you have an industry of, of, of agriculture coming up. Mm -hmm. So uh, you know, people should want to see you succeed in that and be one, one among many buyers who buy from diversified agriculture. Yeah, we hope so. We've always envisioned um, our ideal situation would be for us not to farm anything, but to buy from a group, groups of farmers, because yeah. um, our specialty is in, not in farming. Yeah, yeah. Um, we've recently had to get into farming because Couldn't nobody's find doing the farmers. it. <laughs> <laughs> we have to show them that it can be done. Yeah. Um, but, you know, um, I think there's a lot of expertise out there among the current farmers that we could draw from if we get a lot of people growing different crops. Now there's going to be a limit because some of the biofuel crops like uh, say canola or, or some of the, the, um, the field crops, um, you do need heavy machinery to harvest them. So if you need a combine to harvest it, you probably won't grow two acres of it because you can't get the machinery scale, there. Yeah. Right. Um, but there, there could be some options um, for other types of crops that you can, could rotate in or even grow around other crops. Yeah. Um, and what we've been seeing so far with the mac nut waste is um, we're getting the mac nuts from the factory, but the factory actually buys from a variety of, of farms. So we actually, in fact, right now are getting mac nuts from a, a variety of small farms. That's the way it should be. Um, and they are consolidated and we, we process them there. To have an industry, you have to have a kind of specialization and centralization of processing. You know, that's why a supply chain <laughs> manager is so important. <laughs> yeah, and, and for the oil crushing material, or the oil crushing uh, facility, you probably only have one or two um, on an island because that's pretty specialized and it's pretty expensive. Um, so you're probably not gonna have one on every farm. But, um, but growing of the crops, we always envision that hopefully it would be more widespread. Am I right in identifying one of the problems here is that, uh, you know, as I mentioned before, you don't know what your market is. Um, it's not predictable, especially when you're talking to selling to the utility um, and competing against other offshore sellers. Uh, so you can't be sure how much to produce. And if you overproduce, you may not have a market for what you produce. So it's hard to it's hard to plan. Uh, you don't have a national market. Maybe you do have a national market. I don't know. Uh, we haven't um, exported biodiesel um, out of Hawaii, um, except we have sold a little bit to the island of Palmyra, who um, used it for their um, power on the island. But um, yeah, everything else has stayed in Hawaii. We haven't sent anything back to the West Coast. Um, it is a challenge not knowing exactly where we're going to sell it. But um, on the agricultural side, the main challenge is not so much the volume, because we know the volume of diesel fuel that's you know, used in Hawaii, we know that that's a market we can penetrate. The challenge is just the price. So um, we, can't, we can't pay $5 a gallon for the oil if, if we have to sell the fuel for, for $4 a gallon. So um, it's just finding that spot where the price makes it feasible for someone to grow, grow the crops commercially. Um, so, so um, I'd say that more than the, the market itself, unless there's a, you know, it, the only way the market will help is if you have a market that's willing to pay a high price <laughs> for the fuel to, um, to support uh, the You know, I wonder which about has that. happened in Oregon. Just sitting with you now, I just wonder about that because, you know, n never a day goes by without some new story about some new renewable installation of, you know, major magnitude somewhere in the world. And I think the, it's not just Hawaii is in a transformation. Everybody is in a transformation. And I was going to say, before I held my tongue, mm -hmm. that all the trouble in the Middle East, you know, is likely to raise the price of oil. And maybe that's so in the short term. Mm -hmm. But in the longer term, if everybody's doing a transformation to renewables, you can't count on that either. Right. Uh, have, you have, have you any thoughts <coughs> about that, any analysis that goes to how to plan your future? Yeah, that's one of the big challenges in our industry is we're um, <coughs> sorry, we're competing against a fuel that is very um, price volatile. So we don't know next year what the price of oil is going to be. Yeah, but people, yet we're competing against. People used to say, I mean, maybe they still do. 
is that ultimately oil is going to be very expensive. Um, the, the question is, if oil gets very expensive, do we care? If we, we have renewables, <coughs> you know, accounting for so much of our supply. Right. And it's not clear what's going to happen here or anywhere. Uh, anyway, let's talk about money, okay? If I gave you $100 million in brand new, fresh investment equity capital, <coughs> would that help you? And what would you do with it? Would help a bit. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, we've, um, you know, we've, that's been one of the challenges in this industry is find, finding the investment. Um, we haven't, haven't gotten a lot of investment from the state as far as tax credits or laws or anything like that. So we've done a lot of it privately, found our own investment money to make this work. Um, and it's been a challenge, it's been a struggle, um, but we, we, keep we keep finding ways um, you know we we envision that with a with a large it, it would take some investment but kind of the next steps for the state as a whole would be to to have a biodiesel plant of the type of technology and, and capacity of the one that we built on the big island have one of those on every other island um, sure that's cheaper than moving it around it is cheaper than moving it around um, it's also um, we would hope it would stimulate the agriculture on that island. Uh, so if you have a plant on Maui, then you could start to explore growing crops on Maui um, to help feed that plant. So um, so to do that, you need money. You do need money, yeah. You need yeah. investment. Um, the plant we built on the Big Island was not cheap. It was not not like our one, the one we no, built on I Maui that was, was stuck ambitious. together. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's very, very new technology. Um, and also, um, as our scale gets larger and as we become, we build a real refinery, which is what the one on the Big Island is, um, there's just a lot that goes, with, goes along with it as far as safety, um, controls, um, just the whole logistics to feed that kind of facility. Um, everything gets a little bit more expensive. Um, so. So that's where we, we find that challenge of wanting to make better fuel at a higher volume, but we do know our cost goes up when we do that. Um, uh, we just we just uh, have to keep finding the market to, to sell the fuel and, yeah. and, and make that map back. Yeah, I, and I'm thinking of other possible challenges, and I'll ask you if you have any others too, but <clears throat> it strikes me that, um, you know, energy is, uh, is fickle in a, in a funny way. It's like the flavor of the moment. Mm -hmm. And the, the moment for the past couple of years has been photovoltaic. And you'll say to me, photovoltaic has nothing to do with transportation. Mm -hmm. And I will say yes, mm -hmm. at least right now that's, that's true. But that, that's what people focus on, you know. And there's nobody telling us, no leadership position here telling us, wait a minute, you guys. Don't forget biofuel. It's got to be part of the array of renewable sources, and it, it's, it's very important for transportation. That's yeah. That's one of the big challenges we face, especially on a statewide level, and coming from the state government, is we haven't seen. Um, we think it's great that there's tax credits and benefits that the state puts in place for wind and solar, um, but but we've been kind of struggling without that. And very recently, this last year, a lot of the federal incentives expired. So that affects us quite a bit. Um, and without a state, state um, similar thing in place for the state, that's a big, big challenge for us. Um, especially when we're looking at things, the state's looking at things like um, LNG, bringing in um, other, you know, building a lot of infrastructure to bring in other kinds of fuels. Um, we kind of question where the where the investment might be for biofuel from from the state side <clears throat> yeah so you what are you looking for from and i didn't realize but i guess sure i did know that you have uh, renewable energy tax credits but don't apply to biofuel yeah. right so you know and there if you are, have, and there's actually um, some biofuel tax credits out there that don't apply to biodiesel <laughs> uh, so that's a another struggle for the state um there's there's mandates in place for ethanol that we we. Oh, you try to convert really that, us. yeah. But it didn't get converted. It didn't, yeah. 
and now we have a tax credit for ethanol, but no ethanol. Right. I love it, the way it works. <laughs> and, and no tax credit for biodiesel. So. Perfect. <laughs> Perfect. But if you wanted to establish this kind of uh, vineyard approach, to use, to use right. my term, um, and if you wanted to put uh, individual refineries on each island and you wanted to you know, bring in some young farmers uh, to, to sort of tip the scales with them and get them involved in diversified agriculture, um, then tax credit would be really helpful, yeah. wouldn't it? Especially to, to start up the agricultural side because there's a lot, as I mentioned, there's a lot we're learning um, and we can't afford to, to pay for all of that research and learning. Um, we have to stay in business. So <laughs> um, <laughs> that initial investment in the agricultural side has to come from um, elsewhere. We, we just can't afford to do it. <clears throat> so no. um, if we are really serious about growing biofuels as a state, that investment has to come in um, from the state or from the federal government. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of equipment that you need to get started yeah. that a farmer is not going to be able to buy. You know, yeah. They can't buy a combine. They're not going to plant crops experimentally because the farmers can't afford to lose those crops either. Um, so uh, that's where that kickstart really needs to come in. Yeah. Well, yeah, true. And um, we, we can't tend to, we can't forget this. It's an amnesia thing that we sometimes experience. You know, everybody hot about biofuel a few years ago, and everybody making uh, you know rhetorical gestures about how terrific it was, and then amnesia sets in. You got to remind them. But I want to say one thing, you know, and that is that you guys have been trucking, use the expression, <laughs> for a long time, yeah. and you have you have, you were the originators of biofuel in the state. And uh, you, you know, through thick or thin, you've kept it going, and um, I, I believe there's a there's a big future for you. So all you got to do is keep, excuse the expression, you got to keep trucking. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> we'll, we'll keep moving forward. <laughs> That's Jenna Long, uh, supply chain manager of Pacific Biodiesel, and the daughter of, of Bob and Kelly King. <laughs> Yay! Yeah. <laughs> And uh, <clears throat> you did a great job on this interview, actually. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and here we are in Hawaii, the state of energy, talking about, uh, um, what is it? Um, hmm. Well, biofuels and transportation and um, uh, keeping fossil fuels out of transportation. That's, that's our mission. Anyway, thanks so much, Jenna. All right. Thank you for having us. Aloha. Thank you.